All right. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar. Uh, I'm Andy Shoemaker, the founder of Nimbus DDoS, and today I'll be talking about some of the most common DDoS incident response mistakes and what you can do to avoid them. Uh, now, before we dig into the presentation, I want to mention that there will be a Q&A session uh, at the end of this. So if you have any questions, uh, please post them to the webinar questions section, and we will try to answer them all at the end of the presentation. Uh, also, before I continue, I want to thank Link11 for organizing this webinar. Uh, in my experience, many DDoS mitigation vendors, they try to sell their products using fear of the unknown. So to me, it's very refreshing to have a vendor like Link11 that believes in educating people and gives a platform to folks like myself to do that. Uh, and, you know, certainly the people at Link11 can tell you a little bit more about their products and services, and I would encourage you to reach out to them. Uh, but I do want to mention a couple areas where I think they are being truly innovative in their approach. Uh, the first is in their extensive use of automation. Uh, many mitigation vendors uh, still today are very much driven by manual approaches. And what this translates to is a less effective mitigation with longer downtimes and increased business losses. Uh, so I appreciate that Link11 is taking a different approach rather than just rehashing the same techniques that have been used by companies before them. The second thing is that they have an AI driven approach. Uh, and I like this because it, it really pushes the bar higher for attackers. Uh, one of the things that I've been talking about for years is the risk of innovative and bespoke layer seven attacks. And I think those are going to increase over time and companies like Link11 that embrace AI are going to be best able to handle these emerging threats. Okay, so let's uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so as I mentioned, I'm Andy Shoemaker. I'm the founder of Nimbus DDoS. Uh, first, uh, please take note of my contact information on this slide. Uh, and if you would like to discuss the webinar or have any DDoS questions, uh, feel free to, to either drop me an email or connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to uh, continue the, the discussion. Now, we do have a lot of material to cover in today's webinar, uh, but before we do that, I want to quickly introduce myself and Nimbus DDoS just to give you a little bit of background on, on both of them. Uh, specifically, I want to mention that I have over 20 years of denial of service experience and over 15 years of operations experience. Uh, now, what this means is that I have a very deep understanding of both the technical and the business aspects of DDoS attacks, and I've been involved with DDA, DDoS attacks from the defender and the security researcher point of view. Uh, so yes, uh, what that does mean is that I have created DDoS source code and I know them at a very deep level. Now, as for my company, I founded Nimbus, Nimbus DDoS to help enterprises be more proactive and prepared for DDoS attacks. And I like to say that we do basically everything except mitigation. Now, most people think you know, being DDoS prepared is simply buying some hardware or service. Uh, but like many areas of cybersecurity, there's actually a process and people that must be set up to maximize the value of any technology solution. And, you know, our big product is our testing platform. And this is a platform that lets our customers launch controlled real world DDoS attacks against their own environment uh, to test their defenses. So to answer the question that, everyone asks me, uh, yes, this means that we launch legal DDoS attacks basically every day, um, which is uh, pretty cool. <laughs> now, I won't go into detail, but we also do have some other related services like uh, risk assessments and training and some other, other areas. Uh, the point is that we handle the proactive side of being DDoS prepared, and we work in a vendor neutral manner with mitigation vendors like Link11. Uh, now, to make sure that we are all working from the same starting point, I'm going to kick off this webinar with some very high-level DDoS information. Uh, now, I want to emphasize that even people who are familiar with DDoS attacks, I want to encourage you to take note of the information since there are many misconceptions when it comes to DDoS attacks. Now, DDoS obviously stands for Distributed Denial of Service, but what does, that, what does it mean when we say that? Uh, the important part is the denial of service part. And what we mean is any cybersecurity attack that prevents a legitimate user from accessing a resource. 
Now that sounds obvious, but there is some nuance to that. Uh, first off, when we say resource, we mean any resource. Uh, people often think of a denial of service attack as something that's targeting a website, uh, but a denial of service attack could target an email server, a database, a phone system, or really any other network connected uh, endpoint. Uh, second, people often think of a DDoS attack as a huge amount of traffic that floods the target. Now, this is often the case, but it doesn't need to be. In fact, some of the earliest attacks back in the mid and late 1990s were literally just a handful of packets that would cause the target system to crash. And uh, very small layer seven attacks, uh, even today continue to cause significant outages for even uh, very large companies. Now, why do DDoS attacks work? Uh, the simple answer is that they exhaust some finite resource that is critical to application delivery. Uh, just as with our last slide, the answer seems simple, but there is, again, some nuance to this as well. Uh, so on the right side of the slide, you can see a simplified version of a common network stack. You have a router at the edge, then you have a firewall, a load balancer, and some application servers. Now, what a DDoS attack does is it overwhelms some resource in that critical path. So for instance, the attacker doesn't need to take the load balancer offline if they can figure out a way to overwhelm the firewall or the servers or some other component. So literally any component in the path could be uh, a target for an attack. Uh, and I also wanna pause right there for a moment to call out another big misconception about uh, DDoS attacks. Now, most people think of the attacks as network exhaustion attacks where you basically fill up the internet circuit and fill the pipe. Uh, now, this is certainly one type of DDoS attack, but again, any resource could be targeted. And I've listed a few here, such as CPU, memory, or storage performance. Uh, and in fact, one of the most common types of attacks that we see tends to overwhelm uh, the CPU resources of firewalls and doesn't actually fill up the internet circuit. So it's, uh, it's, not, it's not uncommon at all. Now, <clears throat> with that technical overview done, let's talk a little bit about the business impacts of DDoS attack. Uh, and it's important to understand the business impacts because this is what dictates the organization's response to an attack. Uh, you can imagine that there might be some small businesses that wouldn't be impacted at all by a DDoS attack. So obviously they aren't going to spend uh, a lot of time or money protecting themselves. You know, for instance, down the street from my house, there's a little sandwich shop that I go to for lunch. They're not gonna spend a lot of time and effort on DDoS attacks because the impact of their business would be uh, pretty much nothing. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, you might have a financial services company that has a massive potential impact so they will spend significantly more time and money defending against a DDoS attack. Now, where your company falls is going to be somewhat subjective, but I've listed some common impacts to consider. So look at this list and first ask yourself, which impacts would you have during an attack? Then ask yourself, how do you quantify that attack? So I think the impact that people are most familiar with is of course the direct financial loss of an attack. So for many online businesses, downtime causes a drop in revenue. And this is especially true of e-commerce, online media, and SaaS companies. But there are other more sinister impacts that often go unrecognized. For example, the damage to reputation or the lost productivity of an IT team. These costs are a little bit harder to quantify and they cost the company indirectly. Uh, similarly, there are scenarios where a DDoS attack can help conceal a data theft, which depending on your data, that could be so devastating as to put the company out of business or cause a massive uh, harm to the business. And of course, for those that are in the financial sector or other heavily regulated industries like healthcare, there is of course the indirect cost of regular regulatory scrutiny that comes with uh, DDoS attacks. Uh, so as you can see, the business impacts can be very broad and one of the first steps to being prepared is to understand the risks within your environment because that's the primary driver that shapes what your defenses should look like. Now, 
uh, based on that last slide, it seems pretty obvious that even for small businesses, our, our objective is going to be to minimize the business impact uh, of, a, of a DDoS attack. And the most obvious way to do that is to reduce the time during which an attack is impacting the business. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about uh, incident response. Now, on this slide, I've shown what I call the mitigation pathway, which is uh, basically detection followed by mitigation, followed by an analysis. Now, this seems, you know, very simple, you know, right? <laughs> uh, you know, you detect an attack, then you take some defensive action. And once you complete, you look back and you see how you could have done it better. <clears throat> but by now, you probably realize there's actually more to it than that. And there's some nuance that needs to be considered. Uh, first, how does detection work? Uh, did you know <laughs> that nearly all incident response teams misclassify DDoS attacks as some other network outage? Uh, so they do. And the reason I know this is because when Nimbus DDoS uh, tests a company's defenses, uh, you know, we do surprise attacks, uh, we routinely see knock personnel rebooting routers and firewalls uh, because they think that the device has crashed or has a software bug. And I'll show you some timing information on this in some of the following slides, but it's a, it's a very interesting behavior and not uncommon at all. Uh, the second item, mitigation, uh, also seems pretty simple and straightforward. Uh, but again, it's not as simple as it seems. Uh, so mitigation hardware and services vendors are all very different. Some are operating in an always-on manner, while others might require activation. Uh, some solutions may be heavily automated, while others rely on manual processes. All of these significantly impact how long an attack impacts a business. And in the upcoming slides, again, I'll give some hard numbers uh, talking about those specific areas. Now, in that previous slide, I said that detection can be challenging. And I'm sure there are people wondering, you know, how can that possibly be? Uh, since a DDoS attack should be obvious just from looking at network traffic. Uh, but again, this goes back to something I mentioned earlier, uh, how there is this misconception that denial of service attacks are always involving a large volume of traffic. So look at the two graphs on this slide. In the graph on the left, you have a one gigabit circuit, and we see that there's a sudden jump in bandwidth utilization at around uh, 2213. So you can see that the internet circuit is saturated and it's very likely due to a denial of service attack. But what about the graph on the right? So here we see outbound traffic dropping at 248 while inbound traffic basically remains about the same. Now this doesn't immediately suggest a DDoS attack to, to most people. And this is where the misdiagnosis occurs. Uh, the graph on the right is in fact a denial of service attack. It's actually a low volume SIN flood that overwhelmed the environment's firewall and caused the firewall to collapse. Oops. There we go, I was having a little problem with my slides. <laughs> uh, so let's look at a second example. <clears throat> uh, so on this slide, we have two packet captures. Uh, on the left side, the packet capture shows a large number of UDP packets with a very large packet size of 1400 bytes. Right? That's what that last number is at the end. <clears throat> and those are all being destined to the NTP port. Uh, a few things jump out that suggest an obvious denial of service attack. First, the packet size is fixed, and it's also very large, which is exceptionally unusual for real NTP traffic. Second, the packet capture couldn't decode the data in the packet, and you can see that it simply says uh, unspecified rather than showing a real NTP query or an NTP response. Well, what about the packet capture on the right? You know, in this packet capture, we see a lot of DNS queries being sent to the DNS port. The, size of the, the sizes of the packets are variable and they seem legitimate and the packets contain real DNS requests. Now, of course, you know, following <laughs> what my previous slide, this is also a, a DDoS attack as well. The difference is that this is what we call layer seven or application layer attack. And these attacks basically masquerade as legitimate traffic and are very difficult to detect and block because of that. You know, they're essentially in protocol um, attacks. 
so I mentioned earlier that we see a lot of good and bad during our testing at Nimbus DDoS. Uh, what I'm going to show are the incident response times for two hypothetical scenarios uh, that are based on things we've seen across various customer tests. So, so this is not a specific customer. This is taking aggregate data across our whole customer base and comparing manual versus automated uh, response. Uh, so first, let's take a look at a hypothetical incident response uh, that uses that manual mitigation. So, you know, naturally the procedures are going to vary from company to company, but this is a common design that we see uh, as we step through the process, uh, you know, take, take note of these estimates. So generally speaking, a DDoS incident response will be initiated by an alert from a network monitoring system or a mitigation solution. Now, the way that the alert is sent and is escalated, you know, that can of course vary uh, and some perform better than others. The most common mechanism we see is an email or, or a page being sent to the organization SOC. The average that we tend to see here with this step is about 10 minutes with top performers averaging about five minutes and 30 minutes for the uh, bottom performers. The main driver uh, for time on this specific step, it's usually determined by whether the organization has a 24 by seven SOC or not. And the level of training in incident response procedures also plays a big piece. So you can imagine a company that doesn't have a 24 by seven SOC, of course, it's gonna take them longer to respond to an alert. Now, <clears throat> once the SOC receives the alert, they generally need to validate that a real event is occurring and that the alarm is not a false positive. Again, this step can vary in duration. And what we generally see is that larger organizations are slower during this step. Now, this may sound uh, counterintuitive, but in larger organizations, the SOC will often need to escalate to other engineers to actually validate the alarm and the environment impact. A lot of times the SOCs aren't fully uh, enabled to do that uh, for themselves. And so the average that we see for, uh, for this validation step is usually about 15 minutes with the top performers running 10 minutes and poor performers taking uh, you know, on average about 40 minutes. Uh, and this is also where that misdiagnosis that I mentioned earlier will often become apparent. So when you start misdiagnosing an attack as a, you know, a network failure, this time just, it can balloon astronomically. Now at this point, the SOC has validated that an attack is occurring. So now they must activate their mitigation solution. And as with the last step, usually large companies perform um, more poorly at this step than small companies. And again, that, that's generally related because they have to do an escalation to an engineer that has the proper access to perform the mitigation uh, uh, step. And additionally, the type of mitigation solution may affect the timing as well. So for instance, if you require things like DNS changes or BGP routing updates uh, to redirect traffic through a mitigation solution, uh, this can easily tack on an extra 10 minutes or more to the timeline. So with our customers, what we see is on average about 10 minutes. And again, with top performers and bottom performers being at about five minutes and 35 minutes respectively. So at this point, we're now hopefully back online. Uh, I do say hopefully because sometimes initial mitigation efforts fail and manual adjustments by the organization's engineers or the mitigation vendor may be needed. Uh, I'm not going to list times for that but suffice it to say that Nimbus DDoS and real world attackers, uh, you know, we are always trying uh, new tricks to try and circumvent the mitigation solutions. And we routinely find holes in mitigation solutions and with mitigation vendors. Okay, so we saw a manual incident response. Uh, what does the automated pathway look like? As you might imagine, the process tends to be much simpler. Uh, just as before, the incident is normally triggered by a network monitoring system or it's detected by a mitigation solution. Once triggered, alerts are generally sent to the organization's SOC just as they were before, but the important point is that this is now a non-critical step. Instead, the critical path is the triggering of the mitigation solution and mitigation activities. 
And so in our experience, the average is about one minute with top performers appearing to be uh, nearly instantaneous. And the bottom performers usually no more than 10 minutes from, from our experience. <clears throat> now in the automatic model, the alert validation step is also bypassed outright since it's basically assumed that the alert must be legitimate. So this step is instant. And then the last step, the actual mitigation, that can vary a little bit. Uh, again, this is primarily driven by the type of mitigation solution that's being employed. So if the solution still requires uh, DNS or BGP changes, this is still going to eat up five minutes or, or so of, of the time. So on average, we see this step taking about five minutes, but the top performers, it might be instantaneous. And with those bottom performers, generally it doesn't exceed 10 minutes uh, just because there is a heavy amount of automation. And just like before, we should now be back online and protected, but just like before, we still have that same caveat, which is that the initial mitigation may fail and require manual adjustments. Uh, and if this happens, the timing would be no different than our manual process because uh, that would require generally some manual intervention steps. So let's uh, let's look at those times side by side. Uh, you know the difference I think is remarkable. You know you have average mitigation time dropping from 35 minutes to six minutes, and even in that top five percent group, we see a substantial improvement from uh, you know 20 minutes to essentially instant. But I think the most striking thing is how much an automatic strategy can help the bottom five percent uh, performers. So you know sure. 20 minutes is still a long time to be offline, uh, but it's far better than being offline for uh, nearly two hours. And now consider back, if you will, to the earlier slide where we talked about uh, business impact and consider those times in that context. So think of your own business and consider what these downtimes might mean and ask yourself some key questions. So regarding revenue, uh, of course, you need to know how much money you lose per minute and this can be calculated based off of gross revenue numbers. So you can figure out how, how, how much a 20 minute downtime can cost you. But, you know, did you consider peak times? So many sites have critical time periods where revenue is at its highest. And this is often the time that attackers select to maximize the impact of their attack. You know, it's less common that they're going to attack you at three o'clock in the morning. And it's more likely that they're going to attack your e-commerce site on Black Friday or Cyber Monday, uh, you know, before the Christmas holiday. <laughs> and then, you know, what about reputation damage? Uh, the key question there is what happens when a customer can't reach your site? You know, do they go to a competitor? Uh, you know, within the SEO world, it's generally considered, uh, you know, it's general knowledge that if a site doesn't load within just a few seconds, the prospect will simply skip down to the next result in Google. Um, you know, but what else, what about existing customers who can't reach your site? Most businesses have an approximation of the acquisition costs for a new customer. So by being offline, what you're effectively doing is you're squandering this acquisition cost and you may never get that, that customer back uh, once they leave. And of course the cost to develop, uh, you know, an existing customer that you've, that you've taken over time all of that is now wasted because that customer has uh, has moved on. Uh, the next item, lost productivity. Uh, this is what I consider the quiet killer with DDoS attacks. Uh, at most organizations, IT and engineering costs are one of the largest budget areas. And these groups are responsible for the technology that drives an organization forward. But DDoS attacks and other crisis response scenarios they cause basically everyone to drop what they're working on to focus on the immediate health of the business. Um, and so what this does is this diverts attention from strategic projects, growth initiatives, and other projects that keep your business ahead of competitors. Now, quantifying these opportunity costs, it's, it's nearly impossible, but I can't imagine that there's any CIO that wants their team distracted by a DDoS attack instead of working on proactive projects. Yeah, you know, be pretty pretty unusual. Uh, next, we have data theft. 
you know, companies have spent tens of millions of dollars remediating the impact of a data breach. Uh, depending on the business and the nature of the data, a data breach could literally cause a company to close its doors. And even during a short attack, a massive amount of data can be stolen. Um, you know, an attacker could steal millions of credit card or financial records in just a couple minutes uh, while the defenders are distracted by that DDoS attack. So, you know, when we look back at those times and we talk about a 20 minute uh, outage and we think that that's not a big deal, just think about how much data can be stolen in 20 minutes. Uh, you know, the, the amount is staggering. <laughs> uh, and then the last thing on here is uh, what about regulations? So, in many cases, regulatory frameworks specifically state the uptime requirements of a system. And if you run afoul of those guidelines, you, you, know, you can expect to have some costly fines and audits and things of that nature. Uh, and it's important that everyone be aware of what regulatory requirements that you have <clears throat> and how DDoS impacts those. Uh, for instance, uh, most everyone is familiar with GDPR as a framework for data privacy. But what many people often forget is that GDPR has a data availability component as well, which means that businesses must think of GDPR impact of a DDoS attack. So again, it's very important to understand what regulatory world you live in. Uh, so all that said, uh, what does Nimbus DDoS recommend as a goal for mitigation? Uh, the goal of course should be instant. Uh, now, it may take some time and there may be technical challenges that make this difficult, but every organization should target an instant response and mitigation. Um, and you saw some of the reasons on that previous slide, but you should try, but, but really you should try for instant response for two main reasons. Uh, you know, one, the cost of an outage is immense and sometimes to the point that it might cause a business to fail. And then two, <clears throat> the ability to achieve an instant response is not so costly or challenging that it can't be achieved. There are vendors and technology that make this a reasonable goal. So if we go back to our numbers that we talked about before, that top 5% that's already achieving instant response, they aren't necessarily doing anything uh, different than the bottom 5%. You know, they're not necessarily spending more time and money what they're doing is they're making smart choices and they're selecting technology, people, and processes that are all focused on that one goal rather than building an expensive and ineffective ad hoc defense. So in many cases, that instant response can uh, sometimes even be cheaper than the ad hoc uh, defense. Uh, now let's uh, change topics just a little bit. Uh, and I'm going to go. I'm going to be going back to one of my earlier slides. Uh, so people who are listening closely may have picked up on something that I skipped past on this previous slide. Uh, specifically, what about the mitigation itself? Now, in the review of manual versus automatic, we were talking about incident response procedures uh, at the enterprise and not the actual mitigation. Uh, we just assume that when the mitigation is active, that the environment's protected. And that right there is the dirty secret of the DDoS mitigation industry. Uh, what is going on inside the hardware or inside the vendor scrubbing center? Uh, the short answer is that we see the same manual versus automatic behavior, and the times for each can vary significantly between different vendors. Now, I can't speak for, for uh, Link11, my co-presenters here, uh, but most mitigation vendors are very opaque in how they protect their customers. Uh, it's usually considered a trade secret, but by doing our testing, uh, we've been able to infer certain behaviors based on the testing. Uh, and we break those behaviors apart into manual techniques and automated techniques. And it's worth noting that a mitigation vendor may have a mixture of multiple capabilities with some automated and some manual approaches. And on this slide, I've listed some of the common manual mitigation concepts. Uh, the most common one that we see is the manual addition of ACLs uh, and filters by a DDoS engineer at the vendor. Uh, and so this takes on average about 15 minutes, but it often requires multiple iterations to refine the rules to minimize uh, the loss of legitimate traffic. 
And of course, since it's being done by a DDoS engineer, it's also prone to uh, human failure and human, you know, well, sometimes incompetence, but uh, <laughs> just uh, mistakes and, uh, you know, misinterpreting of data and, and things of that nature. Uh, another behavior that we see is that just because you're sending traffic through the vendor doesn't necessarily mean that they are blocking the attack yet. Uh, so in some cases, an internal escalation occurs at the vendor in which they have to then detect the attack, then a DDoS engineer investigates, and then if it's confirmed, internal routing is adjusted to direct the traffic through scrubbing equipment at the vendor. Um, so obviously, again, this is prone to human and process failures, um, just like any of the other manual approaches that we talked about. Uh, so now, you know, what do some of the automated techniques look like? Uh, many of these are just the automated versions of what the DDoS engineer is doing behind the scenes. So instead of adding manual filters, there might be really good default filters that block most common attacks and packet validators that are automatically blocking suspicious data. You know, these aren't perfect though, since an attack that isn't detected may still require uh, manual filters. But what about if you could automate the engineer's behavior further? And this is what the new AI and machine lear learning algorithms attempt to do. Rather than using simplistic filters and policies, these are looking at dynamic behaviors and creating filters in real time that are specific to a customer's unique environment. So what is the takeaway from this webinar? Uh, if the objective is to minimize business impact of a DDoS attack, then manual processes and manual mitigations are the antithesis of that objective. A few key areas are, one, if possible, use always on routing to avoid BGP conversion times. Um, you know, Just by having uh, BGP updates, you're automatically adding in a significant amount of time to your to your response. Uh, two, embrace process automation. Uh, automation generally reduces errors and it's much faster than an engineer. Uh, three, AI and machine learning will detect the most difficult attacks much quicker than an engineer manually analyzing traffic and manually applying filters. And four, you want to start with great default protection policies to block the obvious attacks. Um, you know, the the really common and obvious attacks, they shouldn't be causing outages for anyone, but uh, you know, every day when we do our testing, we encounter uh, uh, challenges where just a run of the mill UDP flood doesn't get detected properly. <laughs> and so now uh, we're gonna go and take some uh, questions from the audience and to help me with those, uh, I have uh, Edward from Link11 joining me. Uh, so if you have any questions uh, either about the webinar, DDoS, um, uh, what Link 11 does, what Nimbus does, um, you know, by all means, put those into the webinar chat and uh, Edward and I will be happy to answer any of those questions. All right, let's see here. We got a few questions here popping in. Uh, let me just read this one. All right, so oh, this is a very timely question. <laughs> so uh, do you see a change in the amount of DDoS attacks in the current COVID-19 crisis? Uh, so actually that's that's probably a better one for uh, Edward to answer since uh, uh, he's, he's on the front lines, whereas I'm doing the more proactive stuff. <laughs> Uh, yeah, thank you, Andy. Um, uh, thanks for this uh, really good uh, overview in terms of an understanding in terms of what real DDoS mitigation and DDoS attacks are currently are, uh, in the market. Um, so uh, just to quickly to answer that one, so the answer is yes. Um, we see that a lot of cyber criminals are now um, absolutely taking the uh, the situation which we are in right now, unfortunately, uh, as a uh, one where um, they will go after the the organizations which are still up and running and are really dependent on online um, um, presence like online retail, uh, online gambling, and uh, online gaming. That's one. Secondly, and I think it's really like sad to hear, is that um, also our um, uh, healthcare and local government and all the 
uh, I would say police and fire uh, brigades uh, and all these sites and infrastructure also under attack. Um, and um, it's really incredible that uh, cyber criminals are doing it, but that we see a massive uptake right now there. Um, and uh, thus, in this case, uh, Link 11 also has um, a situation where we have said, okay, let's have a look at this. We see this uptake. And we also see that these type of um, organizations have a, a big issue uh, with uh, actually uh, already performing um, uh, the first hand of curing this disease. So we have said, okay, let's make sure that we protect those guys. And uh, currently we are in a process that we have a free of charge status mitigation tool out there specifically for those healthcare organizations, local governments, et cetera. So um, that's basically what we've done because of the uptake in terms of uh, the amount of DDoS attacks which we see in the market and some other stuff which we're doing now, especially because um, we want to make sure that the economy keeps on moving, but specifically that uh, the people which are trying to uh, save lives uh, have uh, full attention to that bit and not being distracted with anything, uh, stuff not working, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, the answer is, uh, uh, in short, yes, we see it a massive uptake, and and yes, also we as Link Lever are trying to do something about it. Great, thank you, and uh, yeah, that's that's fantastic that you guys have something uh, for those uh, uh, people in the healthcare uh, space. I mean, that's uh, it's important for all of us right right now. Uh, so th the next question, actually, it's a little bit similar, um, and, and it reminds me, actually, of an um, important point that I wanted to make. Um, so the question was, how do you envisage the current crisis and working from home policies will impact DDoS mitigation efforts? So it's it's sort of the same, but a little bit different. And this one I'd actually like to answer. Um, so when we do our uh, risk assessments for our customers, um, you know, one of the things that we do is we try to uh, prioritize the criticality of certain target systems that might be uh, attacked by an attacker. So you can imagine that, you know, e-commerce systems and, uh, you know, th those sort of things tend to be the business critical applications. Now, what's interesting about the current situation where there's a lot more uh, work at home uh, people is that systems that historically weren't considered business critical are now being considered business critical. So, uh, you know, historically, remote access devices like VPN uh, concentrators and things of that nature, they were generally important to a business, but they weren't uh, given the same emphasis as, say, a production website or, uh, you know, a, a shopping cart on an e-commerce site or something like that. Um, but now, because you have this uh, massive workforce that's working remotely, uh, those those systems that historically weren't as critical are now becoming much more critical. And of course, those sometimes are not as heavily protected at some uh, organizations as they as some of the other areas of the business. Um, so I don't know if you have anything to uh, uh, comment on on that, Edward. I think uh, it, it might be a, a little bit outside your area, but uh, do you have any any items that you'd like to mention on that? No, no, I think you just covered it yourself. So yeah, okay. not, not there, there, sorry. Yep, cool. Uh, let's see what other questions do we have here. Uh, uh, this is a good this is a good one. I like this one. Um, what are the most critical KPIs when evaluating uh, different technologies? So um, I'll I'll answer this, but I, I'd imagine Edward, you probably have some stuff to uh, comment on this as well. Uh, so from my perspective, the the big one is uh, the time to mitigate. Uh, now when you when you talk to different mitigation vendors. Uh, one of the things that you'll see is that they'll have, uh, you know, in their contracts, they'll have certain uh, certain SLAs for uh, how long it takes to get an, a DDoS engineer on the phone and some other things of that nature. Um, but what many vendors don't have is any commitment to the time to mitigate. And frankly, that's the most important uh, metric that you can measure because as we talked about in this in this slide deck, Every minute that you're down is uh, the risk of data theft, the risk of you know revenue loss, the risk of damage to reputation. So you know uh, having some sort of uh, measurement of that time to mitigate and some sort of commitment from the vendor, in my opinion, that's uh, pretty much the most important thing that you can do. Uh, Edward, anything? 
So uh, yeah, thank you, Andy. Um, um, I, to be frank here, my my answer will be biased, right? But what we've seen, indeed, and I can only uh, 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 add some more color to your answer because I think you're totally right there, is that uh, there is right now, as we are moving and into a 24 by 7 economy, downtime is not done, right? Uh, whenever, just imagine yourself. I go to a, uh, a online store and you want to uh, um, uh, try to buy something specifically now, right? And it will take like more than 10 seconds or maybe longer than that to load or even doesn't load, you move on and go somewhere else. So time to mitigate is really, really, really key. Um, uh, hence, we at Link11 have uh, put something forward which, is, which we will have in our SLA, which states that we will guarantee 10 seconds time to mitigate. And uh, that's uh, according to some um, uh, uh, the likes of Gardner and, and Forrester. They say it's the fastest which is out there in the market, and we will put in paper, right? That's one thing. Secondly, is is you 100% correct there, uh, and he is a, a AI slash machine learning is really key. Um, um, having human beings uh, fighting against uh, uh, machines because that's what they are now using the cyber criminals is a a lost battle. And uh, hence, uh, if you're looking for something, make sure you have a totally AI machine learning based solution. Uh, um, and again, of course, that's what Link 11 is, but uh, um, that's why I'm saying it, of course. But next to that is, is uh, don't be confused by uh, organizations telling you that they have an AI based or machine learning based solution. Um, and then you ask them, what, so what's your time to mitigate? And can you actually, um, um, Put an SLA in, on, on it, and the SLA in in, in I'm not sure what our, our other competitors do, but they will mostly be best effort, and and that's really key that you have a look at those things. And next to that is um, um, I also get a question. I don't know what's, what whether it will pop up or not. Andy um, is around uh, um, the difference between a hardware based and a more services based solution. First of all, services based is uh, 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 you don't have an upfront investment, that's one. Secondly is you can imagine that when you are served from the cloud, that um, before it will hit your infrastructure or anything, um, that it is already be, has been mitigated. So traffic can still go through easily uh, without actually hitting your infrastructure and then suddenly your pipe is clogged up, right? And you will start mitigating it on uh, within your own infrastructure but uh, that in this case, it's, it's already too late. It should be done uh, way before that. So I would say look at uh, mainly AI and machine learning based, um, uh, uh, preferably 100%. Secondly, the time to mitigate should be really, really fast. In our case, uh, 10 seconds. And thirdly, it should be a SaaS-based solution. And, uh, and that was, I would say, most of the times, these things which uh, uh, I would say also our customers don't ever look at RFPs and RFIs coming out are looking for right now. Yeah, actually, you know, I, I want to sort of emphasize something that you said because uh, it's something I see quite quite a, quite a bit with my customers. Um, you know, the the weakness that you talked about with the on-premise appliances. Um, you know, I think people because they're accustomed to buying, you know, things like firewalls and and uh, you know WAFs and other you know cybersecurity hardware, um, they think that they can you know, basically follow that same model where they bring an appliance in-house and they uh, they can block the traffic that way. Uh, but you're, you know, it's, you're absolutely right. There's this common misconception that people can put an appliance on premise and it will protect them against a DDoS attack. But the, the point that you mentioned about it overwhelming the upstream circuits is, you know, it's spot on. You know, the, you know, like if you had, if you had the ability to to host that appliance further upstream, like if you put that appliance up in your ISP or something like that, then it might make sense. But the reality is that it's behind the circuit and the circuit is the bottleneck in many cases for these volumetric attacks. Um, so by using a cloud vendor, you're only getting the clean, uh, you know, the clean traffic. And, uh, you know, I talked a little bit in this presentation about misconceptions. I actually have a blog post on the Nimbus website where we talk about some of the misconceptions. And uh, one of them is centered specifically around uh, the on-premise appliance piece because 
so many companies spend a lot of money with on-premise appliances, and then it just takes a very simple volumetric attack from you know a handful of Amazon servers to take them offline, um, which is uh, usually pretty embarrassing. <laughs> so let's let's see what other questions we got here. Um, we got a bunch of stuff. Uh, let's see, some of these are very similar. Uh, so I think we already answered some of these. So give me a second. Uh, yeah. uh, well, this is this is one that. Uh, well, this is definitely for you, Edward. <laughs> uh, so the question is, how quickly is the technology ready to use? I assume they're talking about uh, mitigation technology. So I'll let you uh, answer that one. Yeah. Look at some of these other so, questions. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I would say that, that it could be seen as twofold. One is is used in a sense of um, how fast indeed can we mitigate? Again, it's ten seconds. Um, uh, within ten seconds, uh, having a a full clean pipe towards uh, our customers as one. The other way of seeing that question is uh, how fast can we be onboarded? Uh, can we onboard a customer? Um, so we, we currently in, in the current environment, we see a lot of uh, prospects as customers uh, which uh, have an instance in terms of a web uh, instance uh, not protected by us and, and they are under attack. They give us a call and we can onboard uh, any customers within a couple of hours. Uh, that could be on on the web part, but also uh, within the um, uh, infrastructure part. Um, the latter one, however, uh, uh, we can onboard really fast, right? That just that's really easy for us to do. Um, is has to do with, of course, that the all the internet routers need to be uh, announcing uh, uh, via us, and that might take a while. But uh, if you talk about any web presence in the sense of applications, then uh, Link11 will can onboard. Uh, we even had an, uh, a customer onboarded within one hour and protected immediately, right? Um, so yeah, um, yeah, but if it's a normal onboarding, then uh, it will take a little bit longer than that. But if uh, push comes to shove, we can do it really, really, really fast. All right, fantastic. Um, so I, uh, we got another question here. Uh, the person is asking, uh, I guess they're in the cloud, and they uh, have a question about uh, how do they protect their APIs. And I actually want to start answering this, but then I'm going to hand it over to you, Edward, because uh, I think there's, you know, there's probably, uh, you know, some information that you can provide from Link 11's perspective. But um, I, I want to actually explain to people what the problem is with protecting APIs and why this person is probably asking how they protect their APIs. So. Uh, when it comes to protecting websites, um, there are many uh, mitigation vendors out there that operate, um, you know, different uh, different types of automated protection. And uh, one of the most common protections for protecting a website against a layer seven attack is they will use things like uh, JavaScript challenges, uh, captchas. Um, things of that nature to basically determine whether or not, uh, well, uh, uh, browser fingerprinting, that's another one. Uh, so they'll use those techniques to figure out whether or not an attacker is a legitimate client or a bot, basically. Um, now, the problem with that when it comes to APIs is that APIs often fail those same checks because an API, uh, an API client Oftentimes they can't deal with a CAPTCHA, <laughs> of course. Um, they often, oftentimes aren't able to execute JavaScript fully because they're not a full browser. So usually JavaScript challenges, they'll fail. And then uh, for sort of browser fingerprinting, of course it's going to look like an automated request because an API client is an automated request. So, <clears throat> so that's the problem. And that's why APIs are actually very difficult to protect against layer seven attacks. Um, now, I'm actually just as interested as the person asking this, uh, what does Link 11 do in that area for uh, protecting APIs? Um, what, do, what do you guys have in place? 
Yes, yeah, so, so we have an API protection module, um, um, and uh, indeed what you just said, right, so it's uh, the connection between two applications and what goes through there is really important that we see that the, 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 um, uh, the uh, behavior there is, is, is a normal behavior, so anything when, when we have our API protection uh, uh, turned on is anything which is like uh, um, suspicious behavior or something like that, which is out of the normal, uh, we can detect really quickly, of course, with our AI and machine learning, and we can mitigate those. So, so definitely, yes, the API connections can be protected there. Next to that, maybe in, in the form of the question, is uh, online presence. I heard, hey, we have an online presence. Um, um, mostly it has to do with um, the fact that uh, sometimes people have a solution which will protect their infrastructure. Uh, sometimes they have another solution which will protect their um, uh, online uh, presence in the sense of uh, uh, an application. Um, a third bit right now, of course, and I know whether that's meant with this question as well, is for instance going to AWS or Azure uh, or what have you. Um, so all of the above, um, those are really easy to be protected by Link 11 uh, because as we are a South based solution, we can really easily connect to anything there and you don't need like 15 different uh, types of, uh, of uh, uh, DDoS protection and just with one solution in the cloud, uh, you can protect yourself there. So including, of course, is uh, the API protection, yes. Okay. Um, and actually, you know, this is a great segue into another question that somebody had, um, which I'll, I'll take a first stab at, and, and you might have some additional follow-up uh, comments on. Um, but you're, you're, you were mentioning, uh, you know, people moving to the cloud and so forth. Uh, so this person asked about the pros and cons of using DDoS protection services that are being uh, provided by the cloud vendor themselves. So, for instance, uh, Amazon uh, in AWS, they have their uh, their DDoS protection solution, and also uh, Azure has uh, similar. Um, so uh, what I would talk about here is that in many cases, uh, this is especially true of Amazon, which I, I, have, I have firsthand experience using them as uh, a customer. And I actually, I love Amazon. I, I you know, at Nimbus DDoS, we use them quite a bit. Um, but one of the interesting things is that you know, Amazon, for many of their service offerings, they assume that you are really well versed in whatever that technology is. So in the case of Amazon's DDoS protection, in many cases, they kind of give you the tools to protect your environment. But of course, unless you're an expert at DDoS attacks, you're not going to know what to do with those tools. You know, it would be like, um, you know, if I... Uh, well, if I was a carpenter and I handed some some tool to a baby, and you know they're not going to know how to use a saw, you know. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, it's it's one of those things where uh, it helps to have the expertise behind the scenes that helps drive the mitigation to success. Um, whereas just giving people tools to add in filters and uh, block things, it, it's not really very productive, and frankly you end up spending a lot of time uh, trying to come up with a solution. And then when push comes to shove and you actually get attacked, a lot of times it ends up falling on its, uh, falling on its face. Uh, so I don't know if you have anything to add on that, Edward, or not, but uh, floor is yours. Yeah, 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 thanks. So, so I, firstly, I wanna add some, some, something more to the, your, your answer is, is um, 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 I don't know whether anyone sees uh, Amazon and or Microsoft as being a security player, that's one, right? So um, um, they are really good at a lot of stuff. Uh, security is, is another topic, that's one. Secondly is, is uh, we see a lot of uh, companies now moving into AWS, Azure, et cetera, but also combination of all. Uh, and as just answered in, in the former question is, uh, you can have AWS and then have a DDoS mitigation tool there, and you can have uh, Azure and a DDoS mitigation there, and you have and then another one where you do the infrastructure. So um, um, it's a choice um, um, whether you want to have your SOC or your security team handle all those. That's also a question which you might ask yourself, and also the cost involved, right? Because you're paying three times for uh, a tool which should protect you all. So that would be my answer here. Thank you. Uh, so I think our last question here, um, 
th this is actually kind of an interesting question. Um, so it says some types of businesses are local or hyper-local. Example, a newspaper uh, in a local language. Uh, can the discrimination of the original autonomous system outside the country of origin be a way to mitigate uh, uh, mitigate the attack and keep the service active locally? Um, so this is something that in our testing at Nimbus DDoS, uh, we've certainly seen companies do this. Um, and even <laughs> surprisingly, even not hyper-local companies. We've had uh, large institutions who have just had a policy of blocking traffic from all IP addresses from specific countries. Like they basically are just saying, okay, it's we're, we're just not going to deal with any traffic coming from this this one area. Uh, now the to answer that specific question about hyper local businesses, um, you know, you you certainly could do some sort of stuff like that. Um, there's a couple challenges though. Uh, so first of all, uh, VPNs kind of screw things up because a lot of people are using VPNs for privacy. And of course that changes where, where your traffic is coming from. So you do risk losing uh, people that are using VPNs for privacy reasons. Uh, the second thing is that, uh, well, autonomous systems, which is what the person specifically asked about, those are not necessarily geographic specific in the first place. Uh, so for instance, uh, AS701, that's the old UUNet, now it's Verizon, but it's a global AS where IP addresses in that AS number could be in uh, Japan, you know, they, they could be anywhere. <laughs> um, and, and I think the third piece is that if, you, if you're looking at specifically IP addresses and geolocation data for IP addresses, uh, the accuracy of that data is very mixed. And uh, this is something we actually know quite a bit about at Nimbus DDoS because we 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 actually do geolocation data analysis as with some of the stuff that we do in our risk analysis uh, reports, uh, looking at traffic and so forth. Uh, so the data is not terribly great in that area. So even though a geolocation database uh, might say that somebody's located in Chicago, it might just be that their ISP is headquartered in Chicago or they they used to have that IP address in Chicago, and now it's in New York or something like that. Um, so generally speaking, it's not a great approach. Um, we do see people doing it, but it's it's a really it's a very blunt uh, blunt hammer, uh, and not very precise. Uh, do you have anything to add on that, Edward, or uh, should I wrap this up? Um, um, no, no, yeah, well, um, just a small bit there is, is yeah. uh, that should be maybe a part of the solution, but uh, it, it, the solution should have more uh, um, so, um, ways of mitigating something, right? And, and understanding and having the intelligence to block something uh, based on on where it comes from or or what type of traffic it is um, in terms to have the lower, lowest amount possible of false positives then definitely right so not not a, not a geolocation but a lot of other stuff should be in a filter to uh, uh, reassure that it is an attack or uh, it is not an attack so that's the only thing I wanted to add there so thank you yeah no that's that's a very good point I mean uh, none of these solutions are built on just one technology you know it's uh, it's a a whole battery of things working together. Um, so anyway, that was the last of our questions and we are at the uh, end of our time. So uh, I do wanna thank everyone for joining. Uh, and if you have any questions for either myself or for Edward, um, you know, our, con our contact information is, uh, I believe still up on the screen here. Uh, by all means, connect with, uh, connect with us on LinkedIn, connect with us uh, through email. Um, we're happy to continue the conversation for anyone that uh, wishes to do so. Uh, so thank you all very much. Thank you, Andy.